Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away If you can use some exotic booze There's a bar in far Bombay Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away O-Week is Orientation Week at university and it's a couple of days basically where there's a big welcome festival to the university and loads of new students coming and joining societies. The entire of like the main avenue of university is filled with stalls promoting different societies so we have a stall there as well and we're trying to recruit all our new members during O-Week for the most part. We have demonstration games and we have our stall for people to come and sign up and ask about Quidditch. This year's O Week was the first one that I was on the other side of the table, so that I was um, spruiking the club and trying to get people to join. Um, mostly I just copied what AJ had done at my first O Week and what JV had done, which was make the sport look really, really approachable um, and make us all look really friendly and non-threatening and non-scary. Marketing Quidditch at O Week basically meant that we were encouraging new players um, to have a try and join out the sport, even if they hadn't played sport before, because there are players who join at O Weeks and university teams who have never played sport before, but they hear about it because of the Harry Potter connection. So for us, it was very much just like, come try this sport that's from Harry Potter, but even if they hadn't heard of Harry Potter, we were still marketing it as a, hey, this is still a sport, but it's one of the only sports of its kind. So it is very much something new and different that we were encouraging players to just come and have a go at and that's how we got some of the best players in the sport today is that they've just heard about it at O Week and been like, I might give this a go and then they've stuck around because they've just loved it so much. Excellent. Uh, other things we did was we had um, seeking. So we had someone put on the yellow schnitt shorts with a tag and we'd find a space of grass that was nearby our stall and we'd just challenge two people to come and try and catch the snitch, uh, which was really, really fun. So this year we were able to have our demonstration games, two demonstration games, on the front lawns of the university, which is really, really cool. Very nice aesthetic location for them. This is just outside the Hogwarts building. Um, and it means that loads of, loads of people are go, walking past and seeing Quidditch as they go past and seeing this as an actual real sport. And saw a lot of people realising just um, how hard Quidditch can be. I don't know, I've got to get fitter because like, I'm, I'm going to do more running. Yeah. Um, getting lots of exposure from that and getting lots of people coming by and just joining in for fun and having a good time, which is a great way to recruit new members. And it went really well. We had passerbyers coming through, um, a lot of people gave it a go, jumped into all the different positions, and it was really, really fun for the hour. <laughs> and then if they see it at the demonstration game, they can come by the stall, sign up, ask more about it, get to learn um, some faces and names and um, get an idea of what Quidditch is actually like. Overall, recruitment and the start of this year was fantastic. And so the first couple of weeks training new players is going to be obscene, ridiculous. Oh my gosh! <laughs> the first session was hectic as, as everything. It was like a swarm of locusts, like lovely locusts, but so many, so many people and trying to coach them and manage them and then also like get to know all of them and make them feel like at home is really, really challenging but also really fun, and they were like, you know, I used to see their smiles, and that was really encouraging. Teaching new players is an acceptance in things are going to be nonsense. People have no comprehension of how this game works, so people have no comprehension about what it should look like. And so the first couple of weeks training new players is going to be obscene, ridiculous. As usual, the number of people we had at those early sessions was like totally mind-blowing. Like there was so many people at those first couple of like come and try sessions, which was fantastic. Um, things settled into like a routine pretty easily after O Week, which is really good. A lot of our new players settled in very quickly. We had a whole like slew of events to get people settled into like the vibe of the club. And so I thought people made friends really quickly this year. Um, the year started with a whole lot of, a lot of really casual events that people felt like they could just like pop in, see how it was, and then leave. Cause you know, I'll just go for like half an hour, 20 minutes, and then I'll leave. Uh, and then everyone stayed the entire night. So I think they were really, really fun, successful events in the first few weeks of the year. Especially the start of the year, we have so many events, not just big events like Harry Potter Trivia and Quid Cruise, um, but loads of little events that essentially are like what a group of friends would just do hanging out normally. Like we have like card game nights, we go out, do like things like laser tag, bowling, karaoke. <laughs> 
trampolining nights. Footy Fridays. <laughs> Harry Potter trivia. <laughs> pub trivia. <laughs> pub crawls. Social volleyball. <laughs> going out for movie nights or movie nights in, that sort of thing. All kinds of things that just groups of friends do because that's what we are basically. And then the later events that we had were like we started to do more like planned events. Like a Harry Potter themed scavenger hunt that ran all the way around Sydney Uni and featured a variety of teams from the club basically race each other around campus try and find different clues and solve different tasks and like solve this mystery behind the scavenger hunt. Um, involved all kinds of different challenges like finding different rooms, finding the stitches around campus, making potions in different rooms, that kind of thing. Um, and it was really, really fun, a good way for people to learn the layout of the campus and just bond as a team, I guess. This year we ran um, Quid Cruise, which is basically like a harbour cruise party boat style thing for the entire Quidditch community of New South Wales. It was really, really fun. We had about 150 people going on this cruise, um, which was a super fun event, quite wild. People had a lot of fun, basically. It was a very busy part of the year because not only were we trying to manage like events, we also had an NQL now to manage as well. And it was great to say that so many of them actually stayed around for a long time. A few people dropped off and we were left with just a solid core group of people. And from there we started intensifying trainings, teaching, positioning and other crucial skills you need for a game. So you see it had a very large number of players comparatively to other Quidditch teams. We had between like 30 and 40 people regularly at trainings um, which meant for just me and Courtney to be handling that all by ourselves we had to try numerous different strategies to keep them interested and involved. My personal philosophy for coaching new players is to break the game down into three parts seeking, chasing and beating. We tried breaking them down, splitting them into like sort of three groups and rotating them through so we could, could all have a slightly smaller group of people to work with and then help and you know bring up one on one and build drills where every single player, old or new, has to participate in each aspect of the game so that all the players can develop a sense of how that game works and what that part of the game is trying to do before bringing it all together. We wanted to get them game ready, so after introducing them to all the fundamentals, we got them into the USQLs, which was our internal league, um, which we set up just so that we could start um, developing their skills and their game awareness and game ability. This year I set out to run the USQL, the University of Sydney Quidditch League tournament. This year it was a five team, six tournament league between all of the USID players. Although we had three NQL teams, we wanted to mix players so that they played with different people, they played with people at different skill levels, um, and they could all learn from each other. So going off the University of the Sunshine Coast, Quidditch League tournament, but then also taking it and making it our own and making it bigger and better and suiting it to UCID's needs. Um, financially, yes, it was very um, costly, particularly because for every tournament we had to hire the field and we also had to hire first aid because we wanted it to be um, sanctioned by QA. So we had to pay um, um, quite a few hundred dollars every tournament for just the first aid and the field. But mostly the biggest cost was the jerseys and that was like over a thousand dollars. But it was something I was really set on because they're a long-term investment. The purchase of the jerseys meant that we had to design logos, come up with names, come up with colors, uh, and come up with an identity, a distinct identity for each team that then each team like ran with and made their own. We came up with the five teams, um, the Abercrombie Auras, the Nicholson Curse Breakers, the Verge Vila, the Wallace Werewolves and Fisher Friends and we split all of our old players and then split all of our new players in between these teams and then pitted them against each other throughout the year in a bunch of like Quidditch tournaments but also social events in order to like earn points and then we finally crowned a USQL winner at the end of the year. We had a few purposes for USQL. Um, for our old players, we wanted to give them the opportunity to try new positions and try new things. Um, for new players, we wanted to give them the opportunity to learn to play Quidditch in less competitive, less serious environments and surrounded by like friends and people who would take a more relaxed approach than at real like NQL competitions. We also wanted to offer 
players who are on teams like the Unforgivables, um, the opportunity to win games and play more even match games, which they got less of at NQL. With the number of new players that we had joining the club at the beginning of the year, we could maybe have gone up to even a D team if we decided to in terms of actual play in NQL, but you're not going to have fun competitive games if you're the D team in a league where no one else even has a B team. It's not going to be a good time. The introduction of USQL is an excellent idea to remedy that. Like, people on the monthly were able to have a fun and competitive, balanced game without having the pressure that an NQL can have. The older players got to take on this kind of mentorship role where they were attached to a group of new players and forced to teach them in a couple of weeks, but really just a couple of hours, how to play Quidditch. So that created some pretty strong bonds. Um, and there were, you could see a lot of like team pride developed, but there was like a really intense um, like team spirit and team community um, that developed. So you got to feel an attachment to a team that was purely social. It's all about having fun with the people that you're that you're lumped with um, at the beginning of the year and I think getting the opportunity to make new friends in the club particularly between old and new players <laughs> she asked for a love heart I gave her a love heart it was just very solid oh, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> it was a really really fantastic benefit from running the um the USQL especially for our older and more competitive players it's just a really great place to chill out for a bit and like not have to care about winning all the time not have to care about making sure every, every goal gets scored, but just having some fun playing Quidditch again. The main focus of USQL was very much on the newer players and very much on developing newer players um, and trying to give them a safe space where they could try out new things and gain some more confidence. Because um, Quidditch is a very fast-paced competitive game, it can be very overwhelming. And in USQL, nothing matters except for the new players learning how to play and learning how to play well and having a good time. And so I think that was really beneficial for them, especially in terms of gaining confidence and learning skills that they could then apply in NQLs and like NQL teams. The benefits of running the league were that um, all of our players got more experience. So every player got so much more practice at playing different roles, at refereeing, and I think that really showed. Like our players improved, our new players improved from the beginning of the year to the end of the year so much, like an incredibly huge amount. And you can see particularly with the Unbreakables because they were so heavy on new players, um, their improvement from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, and I think USQL, so playing all of those extra real games of Quidditch definitely played a role in that. Training only does so much. You need to be in a game to fully understand the position, the roles, everything you do. So for either a newer player or someone who's trying out a new position, USQL was a godsend. Extra quidditch is always good, extra practice. Um, and I think the community aspect really um, led to a lot of newer players actually hanging around more. And I think it was kind of like the starting grounds to having um, players become like more competitive as the year went on because they were able to play and have fun in a like non-serious, non-pressured environment. USQL was excellent. And it was a great thing to have such that the NQL teams could be more consistent and more competitive. So something that's great about Quidditch actually is that you can play as competitive and as non-competitive as you want um, and it's really open to um, the level of play you want to bring. Um, I think something that was really good though that this year was that we had an ABC team structure in that um, we did have the different levels of competitiveness and it also motivated the more competitively minded players to like come to trainings and continually strive to improve themselves so that they could make the move up to um, another team. There was some criticism when UCID started to have like more teams that um, having more teams within one club would lower the quality of the sport and I think as a club and team-wise we've definitely proven that wrong. We have such high level players both divisions and I think that's really impressive and I think that can definitely be counted as success. So earlier on in the year the Unbreakables were definitely playing with a bit more of a relaxed mindset because they weren't sure how they were going to go throughout the year. So they were still testing out new things, testing out players in different positions as we had some new players and new recruits coming to the Unbreakables team this year. 
and seeing how they would fit with the dynamic of the players who were already on the Unbreakables from previous years. My overall goal was uh, for the Unbreakables was um, just to prove that we could be a good competitive team. But as the year went on and we did start to prove that, um, that goal shifted into winning Div 2 finals. When they announced two divisions, I was really excited at the prospect of Unbreakables having a shot at winning second division, um, especially when they started getting really good really quickly. They all learned how they could work together, learned what worked best in some game scenarios, what worked best in others. So they were actually creating their own plays, creating their own sort of subbing orders so that they could make sure that everything was working well no matter who their opponents were. You go into a game and people don't think you're a threat. They expect to walk over you because you're a B team, you're not the A team. We prove it was so wrong. <laughs> I think we managed our team synergy um, really well. We made sure that everyone was playing um, with um, players that matched with their play styles, um, and that worked really well. So I don't think being a B team um, impacted us significantly. In terms of integrating new players um, into the team, um, for the Unbreakables anyway, luckily for me, it wasn't like a super difficult task. We have such a breadth and depth of like talent and dedicated players that um, all the players that became Unbreakables and joined the Unbreakables were all ready to bring their A game and ready to um, constantly learn and improve upon themselves. They did pretty well over the gear and got better and better. Um, their passing play was beautiful to watch, like it inspired us as unspeakable players. Um, and not only that, what I really enjoyed was seeing the confidence of the female players grow. Um, at first they were really timid, which happens, especially when you don't have much of a background in sport as a female player. Um, but you like seeing them grow and get so much more confident ball handling over the course of the year, um, making plays, making cuts, directing each other and other players was one of the most inspiring things as well. Especially as a female coach who has been aiming this year to encourage and build our female players. When it comes to the Unbreakables and who they were most invested in defeating, it definitely came down to a mix of the Weasleys and UNSW. Both of those teams, um, all three of the teams had a really strong um, social connection. They all seemed to enjoy playing against each other and have good camaraderie between them, but were all very neck and neck for a lot of the year here, um, scoring similar points margins against other teams and having really tight, grindy matches against each other. Because all of the teams had some fantastic beaters, had some great quaffle players, and what truly came together, we saw, I think, from UNSW and um, the Unbreakables, were that they um, developed a synergy, and they developed a pattern of play that worked for them really well. But all in all, I think the Unbreakables proved that they were a, a team with more um, depth and a team with more coherent strategy. We didn't have our regular being beaten into submission by someone because we know they're going to be better than us.
The Unforgivables definitely had a really, really strong atmosphere. So we could let anyone who wanted to play play. It was a really fun team. Yeah, very much owing to the captaincy of um, Lillian and Henry that really brought together this team that supported and enjoyed each other, uh, enjoyed playing with each other, and went after playing a game the way they wanted to and making it fun. Who were great at motivating players and helping players try to be the best players they could be while also still having fun and being an open space for anyone to try and play quick. So that was fantastic. And they ended up winning some games by the end of the year as well, which is always great. The Unforgivables from the get-go were a team that we were here for, for game time, for fun. The goal by the end of the year was just really just to have fun, to make a new community, to make a new team and see where, see where it took us. I knew that a lot of the newer players were going to end up on the Unforgivables and I just wanted to give them a similar experience to one that I had, which was one that was fun, really inclusive and you know um, was really exciting. <laughs> Lillian turn! Yes. 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 Better run! Yes. Go! Better go! Go! Yes. Go! 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 He was beat, he was beat for yeah, yeah. I wanted players on the team to come out of each tournament feeling as though they had learned something and could take something away from the experience. I wanted people to be able to go back to training and work at the things that they had noticed they needed to be better at and then come back to next, uh, the next tournament feeling good and like they could put those into practice. I think for the most part, a lot of the players who stuck around were able to do that very successfully. People on my team came from a very lacking sporting background and were new to sport in the first place. They were improving, and they did get better, but it took them longer than maybe people on higher teams. Lil, you got heavy job. Lillian, you got middle hoop. Oh. So managing the Unforgivables this year was definitely easier than managing the Unbreakables in some aspects, but it was harder in other aspects. In some of the ways it was easier was that there was never any real strategy to winning games. A lot of the games would just be involved in making sure everyone got game time, everyone went on the field, making sure everyone was in high spirits. But in some of the ways that it was harder was that most often than not, the Unforgivables would actually have much fewer players than expected. There were many tournaments, in, especially in the later half of the year, where we'd have a rostered squad of at least 18 to 21 players, but more often than not, only 11 of them would actually turn up on game day. So it was very hard to try and make sure that everyone was still staying in those high spirits, but also making sure that they were being looked after, making sure they had the support so that they could be taking the breaks. But it got very hard because it would be like, you've just come off, you have two minutes as a break before you go back on again and it just became very hard for some of the players. But they, like I said, we had the support from everyone else in the club to make sure that they were all doing well, all being looked after. I was really committed to getting everyone like organized, well up to date, informed, uh, knowing where they had to be and when. But in terms of like strategy, I knew nothing about that. I relied on Kat and everyone else for that. Um, in I just wanted to take care of the community and the social side of it. I just did the job that was in front of me, which is sometimes meaning, meaning I had to message people just to make sure they knew all the info, but, and on the day, it was just take things as they come. Just make sure everyone's in one piece at the end of the day. Yours, Dad, all yours! Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Go, Dad! Go, Dad! We had a lot of challenges in building that team and getting that team to gel and synergize like as players and as friends because we had a lot of you know entries and exits we had t tons of new people coming arriving and then staying with us for only a little while. It was honestly quite difficult integrating both players new and old together in a team where there's different priorities among the members. Um, at the beginning of the year, we have a team of roughly a third experienced players and two thirds very new players just trying out the sport for the first time. Um, 
integrating it there is a little bit easier than it is later in the year or throughout the year when everyone is new at the same time and they're all able to support each other and learn new things from each other as together. At NQL, my favorite games were always our games against Wollongong. They were always the ones which were closest to the closest to competitive, where people felt like they could try things and felt like they were doing things that actually worked. It was always a lot of fun too. The people on Wollongong are lovely people and it was always very, very friendly. <laughs> The Unforgivables also fought for every single little inch that they could take from every other team. Teams that everyone expected to be better from them, teams that everyone every, teams that everyone expected to be better than that. The Unforgivables managed to find holes and drag points out of them. Um, even to playing a snitch range game against the Unbreakables for like 15 minutes or something. Um, and for that I am immensely, immensely proud. Yes, Henry! There was a huge amount of passing, a lot of communication, all of the skills that you usually would see weaker in um, underdeveloped teams was really rampant here and was really strong and powerful. And it really showed the, the way that the team bonded and really um, fought for everything, even against teams that they might be expected to lose against was impressive. Um, and I think it was really nice. So the Unforgivables being the only C team of any club in Australia, I think that it meant that they had no expectations. It meant that no one was really expecting anything from them. So when they came out and they were winning games later in the year, it was really exciting for them because it meant that they were actually doing something that they'd been trying to do all year, trying to get better, trying to learn as players, trying to improve as a team so that they could win those games. And so just all the love and support they were getting from a lot of members outside of UCID as well just meant that they were able to just keep going and just keep improving. <laughs> For Unspeakables, from the get-go, it was very much, we are starting out as a good team, we want to try to be the best team by the end of the year. Um, and so it was pushing people very hard to try and be the best players that could be, and pushing the team very hard to try and push the team to be the best team that it could be. When we were looking at the big goals that the teams and the clubs had um, in previous years, one of the big goals we had was win trying to win the national tournament quaffle at the end of the year. I guess when I was elected captain um, in 2016, one of the players asked, do you think we can win Quaffle? And as part of the whole selling myself as captain, I was like, yes, we can win Quaffle. But after Quaffle 2017, we, we sort of realised more, um, how much more there was we could do. And um, I think after we finally were able to beat Serpents for the first time in ages, well, first time ever, it was like, okay, now we're seeing like actual improvement and we can keep going from here and it's actually a real possibility of us being able to make Quaffle finals. From the start of the year it was this is the year we're going to win Quaffle. We've been trying for several years before then. Like me and Sam had been playing together since 2015. 2015 we came third. 2016 felt like the year we were going to win Quaffle and we came really close. 2017 didn't feel like the year we'd win, we'd win Quaffle because it was like a rebuilding year for us. So we came we did really well at Quaffle at the end of 2017. And at the end of 2017, we're like, oh boy, we did really well. We're not losing many players. We're only going to get better from this year. 2018, we're coming back and doing this thing. We're coming back and winning this thing. And so I feel like after that Serpents game at Quaffle 2017, we were like, damn, that was awesome. Let's come back next year and win this thing. Um, so that's really the moment I consolidated, like, let's win Quaffle. So obviously the Serpents were our big competition for the year. As top team of the state, they were like our main rivals. The Serpents as a team who are, for the most part, ex usid made for a really interesting team to play against, especially at the start of last year. 
when it was like playing against all our old teammates and the people who had taught us how to play Quidditch. And as we developed into a very good team in our own right, and as they were like one of the best teams in the state, it really meant the two of us teams as both very competitive teams and very good teams were butting heads a lot. And we did have some very, very competitive, very, very grueling games. And especially this year, um, over the course of the year, we played six games against Serpents. They won three, we won three in alternating succession. So it was a really intense rivalry, really intense set of games. And all of our best games this year have been against Serpents, basically. So it's been really good to have that rivalry. I think it really pushed both of us as teams to play better and better. Um, and it really worked out for us come to Quaffle when that rivalry pushed us to be the best team we could be, I think. It was like, well, if we're going to win Quaffle, we're going to have to start beating good teams. And I think, obviously, Serpents, Western Sydney and ANU were like the three big threats that we saw, that we had to overcome. And I guess it wasn't so much an expectation, but like a goal to see if we could beat those teams. So they were probably um, our top threats coming into the year. And then eventually, yeah, it was, it was mostly Serpents that we were like really had to work for. May NQL where we first beat the Serpents was the first time that that happened. It was the first time they came up against one of the top teams in the country, like the Serpents, who was, in my view, the top, like the top team in the state, top team in the country, thereabouts. And finally breaking through that barrier and finally getting that win over them was the first time in the year where like everything actually seemed possible. And the whole goal of like winning Quaffle was like, now this is real, now this is the thing I can actually do. And I think it really motivated us because we were suddenly like, oh, now like this is a thing we can do. We can actually do really well and we can win. And if we just keep working, um, you know, who knows where we can go. At the end of 2017, our speakers were a good team. And we weren't changing that team very much going into 2018. So it was really about making a good team the best team. And it was really about pushing everyone to their limits and pushing everyone to the next level of high quality gameplay. And that was why we made Unspeakable Training Squad a thing. It was a place where we could take all the best players in the squad, all the best players who know how Quidditch works, who know how, all the basics, who know how to catch and throw a ball, who know how positioning, all that sort of stuff works, and take them to the next level. Go with like high level um, strategies and set plays and that sort of thing, um, and turn what was a good team into a team that could actually win finals and quaffle. The Unspeakable Plus trainings were a lot more intense compared to the club trainings because there were fewer people and also because you've got people who are more committed, more competitively minded and also just of greater skill level. We set these up so that we would be able to have a more intense version of training once a week or once a fortnight so that we could up our game and develop high level skills and strategies that we would need in order to compete and win at NQLs and quaffle. The results were always amazing. The way we could apply what we were learning and target it specifically to things that were giving us trouble um, was something that we wouldn't have been able to do if we were training with everyone in the club. So the Unspeakables trainings helped a lot. Um, they both helped with sort of being able to play around with new strategies and new ideas um, and sort of a bit higher level than what we do with the sort of open trainings to like, you know, everyone of all abilities. Um, as, but as well, it, it pushed us, it definitely pushed me um, to work a lot harder than we do in normal trainings. Like, because everyone's of such high quality, everyone is such a high quality player, um, it really makes you work for everything that you do and you have to push yourself so much more and push and, and in doing that you push each other and everyone gets better and I think that was really clear um, over the course of the year how much how much more work we put in every time because we had to we had to keep upping each other um, in order to make things happen. In terms of what worked best at trainings I think it was really developing that group ethos of like not just working hard for yourself and just trying to improve yourself as a player but trying to work hard for the sake of the team. Like, not just playing for yourself, but playing for the team, not just working for yourself, working for the team. Um, and keeping that end goal of quaffle and finals and so on in everyone's mind. And keeping everyone in the sort of belief that this is actually a real thing that we could do. We have to work really hard to do it, but we can do it. Like, this is very much a thing that we can do. Um, I think really helped motivating people. I think also organising the extra Unspeakables trainings was our other way of planning. So we could 
come up with these things that we wanted to try and implement them in a, like a challenging environment um, of just playing against each other and constantly forcing each other to be better. All of the teams were doing really well up in the first semester of NQL and writing off that we went into um, midwinter and we have Mud Bash. So for club teams in Australia there are basically four big tournaments and the first of those is Melbourne Mud Bash. So Melbourne Mud Bash is a big interstate tournament that's held down in Melbourne obviously um, in the middle of winter which is why it's called Mud Bash because it's typically rainy and very cold and muddy. Um, and so teams from all around Australia come down to Melbourne to play in this interstate um, tournament. You're not just playing like a full weekend of Quidditch, but you get to go and travel with the team somewhere to play Quidditch because it's always so much more fun being able to travel with the team and stay with the team overnight. Um, just hang out the entire weekend and playing really good Quidditch. So going into Mud Bash, we were looking pretty good as a team that could win Mud Bash, but like obviously lots of other teams there had a very, very good chance like Willows, Muggles, Manticores, the other um, New Wales Merc teams and so on. Um, and by the end of pool play, we had finished second in our pool to Manticores and so we had a very long hard slog into the finals, which was an incredibly tough series of games um, for the most part back to back. Because on the second day we ended up playing six games, we had a really tough run to finals. And we were exhausted by the end of day two, but we managed to get to the finals by some absolute miracle. Mostly Alex bailing us out of every game with an amazing catch. I wonder, oh, oh, um, But I think that how hard we had to work for that win, um, because on the second day we ended up playing six games. We had a really tough run to finals. Um, we had a small squad, a lot of people were sick, um, so it was really great that we could rally together and pull off that win um, that, you know, we, we hoped we could get, but we honestly, I don't think any of us ever expected would actually happen. But it was also really hard um, and everyone was absolutely exhausted. And the team we ended up playing in the final had played like three games that day. Um, so we were definitely at a disadvantage going into the finals after that run. We had a small squad, a lot of people were sick. Um, so it was really great that we could rally together and pull off that win um, that we hoped we could get. But we honestly, I don't think any of us ever expected would actually happen. And winning Mud Bash for us was huge because it was the first tournament we've won that year. It was the first of the big four and it was the first time in that year where like winning Quaffle became like a real possibility because like now we've won the first thing um, and it just made everything else seem so much more possible all of a sudden. So it was kind of a big step for us in terms of becoming more competitive. So the second of those big four tournaments is Midwinter Cup held up in Newcastle and that's another big interstate tournament essentially, which features mostly, mostly New South Wales teams, but also some interstate players as well. So we went into midwinter, it was the weekend after Mud Bash. We were very tired already, um, I, know I was sick, quite a few of us were sick, injured, um, especially our first game of the day was against Serpents and we had like three people get a little bit injured. So we weren't having a super great time, but we, we pushed through. Um, sort of the end of the first day, regrouped the second day and managed to earn a place in the finals. Midwind was a particularly tough tournament for us because we were down a lot of our main players. Um, we had a relatively small squad, especially in terms of male chasers, we had very few of us. And by the end of this two-day tournament, a lot of us were sort of injured or on our last legs. And going to that finals, we were like, do we actually want to play this? Do we like, think we have a chance of coming out of this uninjured? We had tournaments coming up shortly afterwards. So we were like, is this more important than like staying on top of the NQL, that sort of thing? Because um, everyone was pretty dead and we had NQL coming up and we didn't want to injure anyone seriously. So we were seriously considering forfeiting. We ended up deciding to play the final because, you know, can't not play a game and give it our all and gave it our all and came away with a gold medal from it.
just caught the snitch off Jono. So it is a catch. However, he's currently being debated by the rest. The current score as it stands is 80 to the Serpents, 70 to the Unspeakables. The catch has been called clean! The Unspeakables have won. The final score is 100 with the catch to 80. And this is the second tournament that we were able to come away with a win from. Yeah, our second gold medal of the year. In semester two, we have O-Day. Um, which meant we were able to run another demo game and get the message out about our club. And that's for a few more recruits, especially um, exchange students who were here for semester two, which always a delight. Um, it's really cool working with them, getting to know them. And then we also often see a lot of them go back to their own home countries and towns and start their own teams. Yeah, so we had the whole holiday break was a very big break with World Cup and Mud Bash and Midwinter. And then we sort of dive straight back into it um, in week one with the club's birthday party. Um, picking up new players like um, Anna and um, Lena and having them settle into a very already established club. And in some ways it can be hard in second sem to get new players in because everyone's so established already and there aren't as many new players, but it ended up working out really well for them, I think, and they had a good time, so. <laughs> it's cool to see like all these new people playing and knowing that some of them will be here in like a year and there'll be good plays by them and I'll have seen the first time they've played and oh, shit, it's gonna be great. Show them this video in a year. Um, most of the semester two recruits that we got were exchange students so getting them was kind of bittersweet because they, um, it was so much fun to have them but then we knew that just in a few months we would have to say goodbye which was really really sad um, but it was great to know how much of an impact Quidditch had had on those people's experience of um, UCID and of Australia and how how we could offer like a sense of family and a group of friends, like a ready-made group of friends that they could just slot themselves into. In semester two, we have O-Day, so we got to run another demo game and there are a few more recruits that we got through. Um, the challenging part about this, especially as coach, is having new people come in right after we've already sort of trained up the other batch over four months. Um, even so, we have so many players um, who are experienced and the newbies jump in and learn pretty fast. And because of that great support and that great community, they're able to catch up to speed and develop um, into great players themselves pretty fast. Said, I think we managed that quite well. Um, everyone on the team, everyone in the club is incredibly social and incredibly friendly. I feel as though the new players who hadn't gotten a chance to play in a, in a tournament before were able to feel welcome and if overwhelmed able to talk to a player who had been there before and figure it all out. Running off the high of smashing and winning both midwinter and mud bash um, tournaments, we were ready to go with our ice on the prize of winning finals in both Div 1 and Div 2. Everything was really going well for Unspeakables. We won pretty much every single one of our games. And then it came to the last one of pool play, the last tournament of pool play. In our last pool play, NQL of the year, we versed Serpents, which was a really hard match and saw another defeat. Max, you got a pull! What? It was a bit of a wake-up call. It really showed us that we had to push for finals that was coming up in a month's time. In a way, it was great. I think it was a really important moment for us because at that point um, in September, we had won Mud Bash, we'd won Midwinter, we were undefeated in NQL, we were on this like big high, and I think everyone needed to snap out of that and realise that, yes, we're a good team, but we still need to work really hard to be the best team and teams like Serpents, teams like ANU, teams like Whisk are not going to give us up for free. We have to keep working really hard to get that. And so Serpents beating us that game was a very like good wake up call. It's like, yes, we're a good team, but no, by no means are we the best team. The, the lead up, the like month lead up to finals was very stressful. Um, and we definitely worked ourselves really hard um, in that week. We had a lot of like squad trainings. Um, we really pushed ourselves because we wanted to be on top form mm -hmm. for finals. So how are you feeling for each of the teams for finals? 
Um, so for finals, I think we can be pretty confident going into NKL finals this weekend. Um, we've done a lot of work going towards it, working a lot of specific, specific skills for different teams. Um, especially for the Unspeakables, we've been working a lot on different picking techniques and that, that kind of thing. Um, looking to get rid of their big players like Damo and Luke on their defense, we can score some more goals past that. I think the Unbreakables are in really good stead to make a run for the top of Division 1. Um, the finals format is um, really favorable for them, towards them for that reason. Um, and I think they're looking in great shape to take out the bottom division. I think our speaker was fully capable of taking the top division. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. What are you hoping for in the game on Saturday? I'm hoping for two nice, easy wins. <laughs> um, I think two, I'm obviously not expecting that to happen. I think, you know, Western Sydney and Serpents have been two of our few most fierce rivals, and they're definitely going to be easy games. But I am, what I'm hoping most for is unspeakable to just blow everyone out of the park and just showing what a fantastic team we are, how well we can play together, um, just the incredibly sexy quidditch that we can play. Um, if we pull it off this weekend, um, we're going to be in a good shot for Crawford. Um, going into NPL finals, we're all very nervous. We've been working our asses off for it, but it was the day that we were going to find out if all that hard work was going to pay off. But we're also really positive, um, keeping those vibes up. We had music playing, we were cheering each other on, we were mucking around, warming up before the games, and it worked. It worked really well for us. Um, we went into each game, fired up. The Unforgivables. Their big goal coming into that tournament was just to not get last and they came out of it getting six out of the seventh teams after coming out with some really great wins against some of the teams earlier in the year and then at finals as well beating Wollongong and having a really close game um, against the Hills Horntail combined team. My favourite part of the year was probably when we won against Wollongong at NQL Finals. It was really the culmination of all the training that we as a team have put into the sport over the course of the year. And it really felt like such an accomplishment for a C team, the only C team in the league, to win a game in finals and not come last in the league. And so they came out of it with high spirits and just made sure that they were there to support the Unbreakables and the Unspeakables in their win. Yeah, so um, obviously the Unbreakables and the Weasleys have had a long-standing friendly rivalry. Um, it's really fun to be able to play um, against a team that we're obviously good friends with across the year. And it's a good um, marker to see like our improvement against a team. At the beginning of the year, um, we lost our first game against Weasleys. And then if you compare it to our later game against Weasleys in finals, and you can really see like the difference in our um, level of play. And it's always fun to just like compare um, how we played at the beginning of the year against a team to how we fared at the end of the year against a team and just like what we improved on, particularly like our stitch on pitch play and stopping drives and things like that. The Unbreakables coming up against their biggest rivals, the Weasleys, in the Div 2 Grand Final and coming out with a really nice win there as well and just seeing both teams just so excited in that they achieved one of their big goals for the year. <laughs> Beating the Weasleys was something else. We had fought so hard, fought so well that year. We only lost one game. Ridiculous. <laughs> Showing the state that we're not just a B team, we're not just unspeakables wannabes, that we were a force in our own right. We fought so hard to earn that, and it showed. Um, you should all be so proud of how you're playing today. Like, some really, really good players. Really good pass-offs, like that last goal with Taylor, like that was so good.
Like for me, it was a very stressful time being in my honors like thesis writing stage. So I came into finals being like, hopefully you can do well here, but I had no expectations for finals. And on finals day, um, we had everyone show up early, even though we weren't playing until the second half of the day. Um, everyone showed up, came and did, um, we just did six V6s and just um, made sure we were like not going in to our semi feeling like we're just coming on field, like we wanted to feel ready to go. Go unspeakable! And we went into the, the semi a little bit nervous, but um, overall, like really good um, quality team effort. The game against Wisk was one of the best games we've played in terms of like how smart we played and how many of the things we've learned we put into good use that game. I think coming out of that hard game into an even harder game with the Serpents in the final um, was really good. Like it was sort of a progression um, that was really helpful to have in like a, a tournament situation because we, we went into that final and we were ready um, and it didn't feel like we'd left anything behind. And then against the Serpents for the grand final, it just felt like everything coming together and not only was like a really fast paced, um, really fun game, it felt like everything we'd learned in training and in training squad like, sessions was coming into practice in this game. Everyone was working so well together, everyone was super gelled, everyone was super excited about how well we were playing. The entire energy of the game was so high. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it at the moment. The final, the, the game of the final was really fun um, in a way that I really didn't expect. We were really nervous. Um, going into it, obviously, is the grand final. But as soon, like a couple of minutes into the game, it just instantly felt fun. Um, I think our whole team had rocked up early. We'd been training. We had a really good semi, and we were just like really clicking. And there was a lot of synergy there. And I just really enjoyed the game. And I think everyone brought so much to that field. Everyone did so much to contribute, and it felt like a proper team effort and it made it so much more enjoyable and everyone was getting around each other and really supportive and I think it's just the way Quidditch should be played like competitive and hard and stressful but also really fun and um, a really good time with your friends and teammates. Disgusting. Okay. It's not about it's not about the noise. It's about the gameplay. Oh, fuck, Ava three from three. Fucking. Yeah. So we got out of range in that game, which was not something I expected to happen. And we were like 50, 50 points up, I think. And I think we just got a bit cocky and not cocky, but we got overconfident and we sort of, in the excitement of the moment, forgot that at that point in the game, we were going to slow things down and take control of the game more, rather than just like playing this fast and hard game. What happened is we just got a bit cocky, we got a bit too excited, we tried to play too fast, um, and Serpents just really brought themselves together and scored like four and unanswered goals, um, which when the snitch was on pitch, so Gary just turned around and caught the snitch super quick. A bit stressful for a while there. It beat his focus in the wrong places and that allowed Gary to catch um, and take us into overtime which is very stressful. Um, but then we like knuckled down again and we realised okay we knuckled out again and we're like okay refocus and then we just went back to our game plan back to our overtime plan.
Yeah. Yeah. Alex managed to catch the snitch, um, which meant that we won overtime, won the game, which was like completely amazing. Especially after such a tight and close and stressful game, um, getting that snitch catch, getting that grand final um, state finals victory, getting that second state final um, in uh, history was fantastic. It was such a intense but really fun game. Um, and it was made all the more fun because everyone was playing so well and enjoying it so much, um, which made it for a great grand final win, basically. Um. <laughs> <laughs> being double division champions, Unbreakables being second division, us being top division um, champions was amazing. And just like the fruition of like all our dreams of the year in terms of both the Unbreakables and the Speakables doing so well in the state leagues was fantastic and everyone was so excited about that. Um, yeah, it was a really good time. And it was our third gold medal of the year and number three or four of like the big four tournaments for that year. But that was sort of the only celebrating we did. Then we sort of like buckled down and we're like, all right, we've done this. Now it's time to um, go for Quaffle. So yeah, state finals meant that we'd now won three tournaments of the big four, which meant that there was now one more left, one more tournament left, which is Quaffle, the national championships. Um, and so that meant that now coming off the back of this big win, Coming back with three big wins, we were now heading into like the final, the final challenge, the final test, um, and what we'd geared the entire year towards, um, which was which was Quaffle. And so that meant now the trainings were all focused around Quaffle. Which is very much a game at this level that's won and lost in the little things like catching the ball. If they're catching the ball, it means you score that goal. It means that we have one more point up. It means they're out of range. It means they can't catch the snitch. It means that we can put up wide on defense and stop them scoring any more goals. Means we win that game. Means we get the finals. Means we win both. The thing is, if we get end up in the finals, how do we get there? What do we have to do to get there? That's what we're training for now. That's what's in everyone's mind. Everything else in the years behind us, it's now Quaffle is now taking over everything basically in terms of trainings. It means we've got to start training a lot harder. So from including club and squad trainings, we up the ante. So using the using your body to get between them and interrupt their momentum, or separate from the ball. But the primary thing I want you to think about is when you have a lead, cutting them off from the ball with your body. So some of the strategies that we worked on um, were just our basic, like man marking, you know, making sure that we knew all our basics and had the, the fundamentals down, um, you know, good passing, good defence. Um, it was really challenging though because it's also when all the final assessments and all final exams start hitting and so people have to kind of choose between committing themselves to two or three trainings a week that are each three hours long or also trying to get all their assessments and trying to study and do really well at uni. We were sort of hindered by exams and stuff but very much like we're training hard using the time that we could find to um, really work um, on strategies to try and win Quaffle. Um, so in the to Quaffle we had not only um, Max questionably out with his wrist injury. Max broke his arm about halfway through the year. First person wants to just like slow them down. Try maybe try and like immobilize the arm. Should use this arm. Yeah. Uh, AJ's ankle was a bit iffy. I also dislocated my ankle at Western Sydney Fantasy, which was terrifying. Um, and this was the first major injury that I'd had personally, so I was like freaking out about the fact that I'd like finally gotten an injury. Um, AJ and Max not being able to train for the weeks before um, the tournament were substantial and definitely affected our ability to ramp up into Quaffle and to come in as hot as we would have liked. And I think it impacted us because even though they were able to play Quaffle, um, they we weren't able to train and a big thing that we wanted is to go hard training into Quaffle and we didn't quite get that um, between exams, between the injuries, between like minor injuries like people's knees flaring up and stuff so we sort of had to 
take care of ourselves first, which impacted um, the lead up to Kofu. Cutting out those little mistakes, playing out those drop balls, those botch passes, those like missed beats, those missed throwbacks, cutting out those little like those little things in the game is what is going to make us the best team at Kofu. Beyond like all all the, all the like the high level strats, like the different plays and different like synergy and stuff, it's really good, but it doesn't work if we miss a pass. It doesn't work if we miss a beat. We know our strats, and we're not going to learn any more strats. So we just need to make sure that the implementation is perfect. So yeah. if we make an hour or two in various evenings in the coming week, I'll be here every day ready, basically. And we can we're do going stuff to like contact that. From probably being up in Queensland this year we wanted everyone up there a couple of days early to get up there to sort of climatize to being up in Queensland in the hot weather of Queensland and also get some trainings in Queensland before we got started as well. And we had a few days just to um, sort of get into the feel of playing in the Sunshine Coast because it's a lot hotter than back home. We wanted to sort of adjust to the heat as well as like not feel rusty when we went into that first game because we do have trouble starting games and we knew that was an issue that we had. We found an accommodation that had a park really close by and so both the Thursday and Friday before the big comp we had unspeakables, unbreakables, unforgivables all training over there for an hour or two session just to make sure that our catching was on point. Basically going over like, like essential skills, catching, passing, all our fast break sort of stuff just making sure everyone was really, really honed in on all the basics before we started the tournament. And so that at the tournament we could really focus on the higher level stuff and not have to worry about all the basics which everyone should have down pat by that point. So the night before Quaffle, um, we all met up in um, Nick Albanoz's hotel room um, where we had a TV and a projector and we made a slideshow about uh, being on time and <laughs> what the schedule was going to be like, but we also had a slideshow on um, the, the teams we saw as threats, like the Melbourne teams that we obviously um, some players didn't know a lot about if they hadn't seen them before. Um, and so we identified especially Muggles players, um, but also players from the Manticores, also players from the Ravens, the Willows, um, that we saw as threats and um, um, made everyone aware of them. Absolutely strong. His plays very similar to that. Time like almost a lot to put together so we can go through specific strats and specific plays and that sort of thing and just quick like last minute cram session revision before finals. super nervous because it felt like this whole year had been building up to it and then we got there and it was raining and miserable and it just didn't feel like kind of what we expected like there was a lot of energy clearly but it was also like let's say nervous tension as opposed to miserable and sad <laughs> we're all where it's it took us ages to find the fields we all got lost at least once or twice probably you're still tired from the lovely hostel we were at Going into it was, was something like, we were also excited just to show Australia why we won Div 2, to show them what the Unbreakables had become, to like, really show off basically, to come in with our neat little trophies and prove that we're not, it wasn't just, and prove that it wasn't just a fluke, that we're not just a B team, that we are a team. Though it was a tough day ahead of us. Off the top of my head, we had serpents, ravens, mantis. We we're gonna have a fucking tough day. But everyone gave it their all, which I'm proud of them. Our Ravens game, um, our first Ravens game on the first day, I feel like we played um, really well. Um, Ten minutes into the game, you know, like we had kept them um, scoreless, which is a great feat because they're a fantastic team.
we had lots of strategy type discussions against like um, the teams that we were probably going to verse, what other, like who were the players that we needed to look out for, um, what plays like worked well, um, strengths that they had that we were potentially lacking in and we needed to like work on and what were our strengths and um, things that would work well in, in the games. Um, our communication and things like that improved a lot. Like at the beginning of the year we weren't communicating much at all, to the end of the year I really think we stepped up in terms of that. Um, individually so many players improved um, on so many things. Um, at the end of each game we'd have like a kind of debrief on like what what worked well and what didn't work well um, as a team or what we need to improve on as a team and going into each um, going into the next game we all um, had like a goal in terms of what we wanted to like work on and improve on and I definitely saw improvement and growth in terms of that and I definitely also saw a lot of improvement in terms of um, strategy and our players um, thinking smarter. Smarter Quidditch was something that we all wanted to improve on as a team and not just like passing around and making stupid plays. We definitely saw that at the beginning of the year so many of the new players didn't know like what slow slow balling was or anything like that. At the end of the year we were able to like cancel presses, you know start um, presses and um, yeah strategy minded the unbreak was improved so much. Day one cough was an incredibly hectic day for us. It was like playing, refing, playing, break, play, play, break, and so on. Um, lots of games, lots of things to watch, um, lots of trying to watch other teams. I think I think we all feel pretty, pretty, pretty excited. Like the entire year had been like leading up to this moment. The entire year had been let's win Quaffle. The entire year had been let's all this that we're doing is doing is for Quaffle. And finally that morning, like well. Now, now we're here. This is this is it. This is the first game of Quaffle, and this is a first really big game of Quaffle again as well against Muggles. Um, and so, I think we we're all a bit nervous, but we're all like pretty hyped to be there. And kicking it off with the Muggles was definitely tough. It was also raining, a bit miserable, um, so it wasn't off to a great start. But the weather did clear up gradually, and um, after the Muggles game, things sort of fell a bit more nicely and we had a fairly straightforward day. Um, I think our other games were challenging and definitely pushed us but um, we didn't have to like, you know, go super hard um, and we were able to save ourselves for the second day. Um, so in our presentation thing, um, we'd analysed the, the offence of the Muggles. They do this um, like come around the side really fast and pass into someone coming in towards hoops. And so we'd noticed this through watching some footage of theirs. And it was good that they did do that um, in Quaffle because it meant we, we sort of knew what to expect um, and were able to, I think, fairly effectively um, counter it with the defence. And I think that worked really well. We had some really great intercepts from people like Anna, which were very helpful. I think that we always thought the Muggles game would be a, a, a tough game that we should be able to win, not comfortably, but like we should be able to win that game. And I think they proved that like that was a much tougher game than we thought it would be. And we didn't pull out a range just towards the end. It was like 30 points up and we won. But it was a very close four game the entire way through. And then even later in the day, um, games where we should be more switched on, maybe letting in goals that we shouldn't have been. That was a very clear indication to us that we need to really up our game and absolutely playing our absolute best. Otherwise, there was no way we are going to get come close to winning this tournament. Um, and even against like the other um, seared teams in our, in our pool, like bin chickens and so on. But they were also like less intense than that first game and so they sort of let us find our groove, find our weaknesses, build that synergy without, you know, pushing us super hard or being super stressful. They played fantastic games against us and really showed us that we need to make sure we were playing the very, very best we could play. Otherwise we weren't gonna fit make it very far on day two. Watching Manicores play, watching Willow Cup Bills play, watching Serpents play, like those three teams were like on top of their game. They were totally in form. Um, and we were not. So that was definitely like a, um, a wake up call for the sort of quality group we needed to be bringing on, on Sunday. From the outset, we, we, we just sort of, sort, of, we sort of predicted that like, you know, if we're gonna make finals, most likely the other team to be in finals are gonna be Manicors. And so if we're gonna win Quaffle, at some point, 
either in court, in either in semis or in finals, we're gonna have to beat the Manicors. And the Manicors are a team we played against in Mudbash, but we hadn't played against them with the, like the top drop bears players before. And unfortunately, with our day one schedule, the Manicors were playing at the same game slots as all as all of our game slots. Um, so we didn't really get a good chance to watch them. So we sent Harry during our Wollongong game across the field to film their game against ANU, who is their number two seed, and in theory their most competitive game. Um, and so Harry, I think one of my favorite moments of Coffle actually was sitting in the sub box in the Wollongong game, watching watching the watching our game against Wollongong. And so I'd be like, hey, where's where's Harry gone? And I just look look across the field. And on the other side of this, of this football field is Harry huddling behind this like tripod in this jacket so no one can see us on Speakable's jersey, quietly filming the Manticore's game <laughs> and getting us some intel on their on their strats, which is actually very useful. Because um, we were, uh, were able to learn a lot from that game and see how ANU are scoring goals and how we could score our goals ourselves against the Manticore's. After the first day, we were very tired because it was five games in a day. So I think most people just sort of went to bed, found their own dinner. We just let people do what they wanted. We didn't hold any kind of team meeting. We did, um, those of us that wanted to, went into mine and AJ's room and watched some footage from the Muggles game. And we also watched some footage that we'd taken of other teams. So we watched that footage and sort of tried to develop strategies should we have to play the Manicores. So that was a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, especially reviewing the Muggles footage I think was really good and figuring out what went right, what went wrong to help us for the second day. I mean, so I went in the quaffle thinking that we had a pretty good chance of, of making finals and winning. I think after day one, I revised my expectations for quaffle, which were a lot lower. And it was sort of like a wake up, it was like, oh, we need to step up our game and really focus if we want to actually, you know, get to finals in this thing. Quaffle was really a really strange experience as well because we, as captains, Henry and I expected that or hoped or projected maybe we could win this game or we could win this game and nothing really kind of gelled together and started working until maybe our second day. So morale by the end of the first day after losing five games in a row, several of which we had sort of expected to do better in, was like, it really affected our morale in strange ways but seeing everyone not give up on the second day was really heartening especially as a captain, because you think that, you know, you're shouldering at least some of the responsibility for the way the team is performing. But um, we had so many, like, individual performances and, like, individual e experiences within games that was so exciting and just so fun to watch. Um, every single game, we managed to pull together something. After having a timeout, after having a, a pep talk in our sub box, we managed to pull together. We scored multiple goals, I think, I think almost every game. And our defense is amazing. I'm really proud of the way people work on the defense and they, ne they never give up. I, I, yeah, I did have a lot of pride for the team, especially seeing them happy after a game when a, a female chaser scores a goal for the first time. That's so amazing. So Ashley's an old player, but she's so proud of all her fellow female chasers as well. Like it's always such a fantastic highlight when a female chaser scores a goal for the first time. They are so happy and we are so proud of them. Um, Seeing you know, older players, you know, support and mentor the newer, then their newer players as well is really heartening to see. My highlight would definitely be our last game we played, the game against the Latrobe Trolls. Uh, we won it in overtime without a snitch catch. It was ridiculous. It was just so much fun and an excellent way to end the tournament. And so they came out of it with high spirits and just made sure that they were there to support the Unbreakables and the Unspeakables in their win. Yeah. We were going into day two, we had the injuries from day one, we had tiredness from day one. We had something to look forward to, we had Ravens and Mantis, and then whoever the pool play gave us. We were nervous, I feel, but we were still keen, we still had some bite to the team. They weren't going to be easy games, and we were not going to make them easy games. Just the, the fight that we had was... Like, I'm, I'm amazed at how well we did in day two. Because, yeah, everyone was a little worse for wear. And we knew that it would be it would be an upset if we won these matches. But we didn't make it easy for them. Yeah. 
In just terms of just like the level of play, the Unbreaker Sport, I was really proud of how we played. Um, I think we played really, really well in that game. We brought our A game and it was really exciting to see just the improvement of the Unbreakers. We, we went in as a B team and showed them that we were a force to be reckoned with. But then, everyone's favourite, Mantis. We scored on them. We caught the snitch. <laughs> like, that last game, sure, the Mantis beat us. They're the top for a reason, but they were fighting. Quaffle had so many like good, like highlight, proud moments for me. Like, really good, and we really showed our own. Like we're a B team, and we went against top players, and we scored two goals. We caught the snitch. Yeah. The scoreline was not that different. Like they're only forty up. Um, that's really. <laughs> they were yeah. not expecting a press. <laughs> Like, oh shit! Not only did we, a B team, come 11 out of 24 teams, the top half of you know Australia, it's amazing, but also just um, the level of play that we brought on the day. So going into Quaffle playing national ranking teams, and then ranking 11th? Holy shit! Wild. Went into day two as as the worst of the top four teams, number four in the top four teams. So day two was definitely stressful. Um, we were seated fourth, I think. Um, and so we started off against a game against Macquarie, who came out really strong. Played a fairly um, straightforward game against Macquarie, which was nice and clean, nice and good. Um, and unfortunately had really small numbers, so eventually got really tired, but definitely like gave us a fright to start the day, um, which was really good going into our next game. And up against the Muggles again for our quarterfinal. Who stepped it up amazingly from their first day. Like our first, ga our first day game against them was, was tough, and the second game against them was next level. Like that game, we could not get away at all. The whole pace of the game was sort of thrown off by lots of delays in play and lots of um, stoppages. Um, and it ended up being one of those, I think it was 30-30 at snitch catch, which is very tense. We almost were out of coffle at that point. Um, and Alex pulled us out of the bag for that one, but yeah, that was what happened with Muggles. And that was definitely a stressful game, um, but I think again we, we did a good job of keeping our heads. It was sort of sad to win because the Muggles are such a lovely team and having to knock them out in the quarterfinals was sad because I really wanted them to go a lot further um, and I think they really deserve to go a lot further. So that was a little bit disappointing but still exciting to win. Our semi-final was um, against the Whomping Willows. Um, so they're a community team from Victoria. They were also the last year's champions so and seeded first um, overall. The theory of Willows is what we wanted. We thought Willows would be the easiest of the top four teams to beat because we didn't wear ourselves as much against Serpents or Manticores. And so like, this is great. Willows, semi-final, we got this. And then five minutes into the Willows game, um, James Osmond had scored four goals and we had not scored any goals. We didn't have control of the entire first several minutes of the game. And it was very stressful. And Willows definitely stepped up their game a lot against us um, from what we'd seen them playing both at Quaffle and in previous tournaments like Mud Bash for example. And it really took a big shift in the game with Harry coming on and getting, getting control back from their very conservative bit of defence and really changing that momentum of the game um, back into our favour again to keep us in range for the rest of the game. And really changing it up from the sort of our very typical sort of Brandon and Max heavy focus game at the start, um, bring on people like Nick and Hayden, um, who really changed up our colorful game a lot against them. That saved us that game. Um, and yeah, that was a game where we were down and out of range and losing that game and had to take a timeout, reset. And I think everyone sort of switched on in that moment and was like, oh, we're out of range. If we don't fix this now, we're losing Quaffle. And so everyone switched back on after that. Where we were like 40 points down, the snitch was on pitch, and we could have easily dropped our heads and let the game go. But we made some really smart decisions, we really made some really smart subs, and everything sort of came back together. 
and in some miraculous three second window of oh we got back in range rather than in overtime range Alex managed to catch thank god for that child and we like won it by the skin of our teeth and a really nice Um, and so that's what put us into finals. I'm so proud of you guys picking up like that, getting two goals in a row, having beat a control out of nowhere. I, I had flashbacks, I was like, this is it, we've lost Koffel, we've lost Koffel. Then you guys do all that, and I'm like, well, if I, I have to do my job now. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, I again in the game. Oh, I was, I was, oh, oh. You guys getting control and getting two goals in a row. I just like, was like, okay, well, I'm gonna catch now. You thought you were gonna sub off, you yeah. dead. Yeah. I can hear the sub off. We had Muggles, 30, 30, switch catch. We had Willows down, out of range, came back into that game. No one saw us being here at all. There's no reason for us to be here except that we worked really hard all year, worked really hard today, and got this far. And the fact got this far is frankly fantastic, and everyone should be really, really proud of everything they've done today. Yeah, so the grand final was against Manticores. I was definitely very nervous going into that game, but it was good. We had a really long... Um, break in between our semi and, our, and the final. So we used that time to sort of rally, figure out what went wrong against Willows. It was simultaneously exciting and really sad because it was gonna be the last time that we played as that team together ever. So it was quite emotional <laughs> right before the final. This is by far the hardest team we've played this year. This is they're better than Serpents, obviously. They're the best team by far in Victoria. They beat Lewis out of range. Um, and so, if you want to win this game, that defense has to be pushing harder than you ever pushed in defense before. And as a team. We have amazing defense. We have some of the best defense in the country, frankly. We have some of the best scrap in the country, and that's what we're going to up and up and up in this game. Um, making sure we're really running on those balls, making sure if someone gets that ball. As far as we've gotten really good. Like, we've gotten incredibly good this, this season. We're a top team in the state, um, top team in our club. It's not easy to play on this team anymore. It's not easy to get on this team. It's not easy to be on speakers anymore. You have to work really hard now. We expect a lot from you and we've worked you really, really hard this year. Point being, everyone is on this team because not because not because like we have to be on this team. Everyone's on this team because Sam and myself and Harry and Courtney want you on this team. Everyone's on this team because we think you have a particular skill that is useful to this team. Everyone is on this team because we enjoy playing with you. We think that person is going to play with, that person is good to this team, I want them on this team. So I think this person is going to be important to us being involved. That's been our goal the entire year. That's been our goal since last year. That's what we've formed this team to try and do. We've formed this team to try and win coffee. And so everyone here is here with that goal in mind. We've been working towards this entire year. We've been working really hard towards this entire year. We've been doing our people trainings, club trainings, trainings up here the last couple of days. Um, and we've worked you really hard and you've all turned up and you've all worked really hard for the entire year. This is the last hour of the work. If you've held back anything up till now, this is where you put it all out. This is where you go absolutely all out. There is no team that deserves to win this game. You have to earn this game. So you have to work hard to earn this game. And Mandicores, this is Mandicores game unless we work really hard. And because of my father, they are But we can be there too if we work hard. If we work really hard, if we everything we've done this year and we practice this game, we're going to smash this team. Yes. That Willows game was incredible. Serpents came in the finals. Incredible. Bring that energy back onto this pitch. We have all of our teams behind us. We have all of these whales behind us. So This is our chance. This is just a whales chance. We are like the champions of the whales. We're the champ we've won. All three things so far this year. Let's get the Grand Slam. We've won all of the finals so far. Yeah. One more game. Let's get it done. Final, Let's do this. Finals. Final. One more game. By now we're very used to high stress games, guys. This is just another yeah. one of those. Oh, I'm I'm sure. Sure. Guys, there is one more game this year. One more game with this team. One more win. And then it's knees time. <laughs> Up 
goal. Brandon grabbed the puffle, ran through everyone, scored on the middle hoop. Um, and it was just a really good way to kick off the final. Um, got everyone really hyped. It was very exciting and kind of wild because I was like, actually here, like, oh my God, this is real. This is finally happening. This is the first time Houston's been in a Coffle Grand Final. And this has been the dream since like that, that time last year. Like, and it had finally been realized. I remember the Manticores having such an incredible defense, such an, it felt so impenetrable. They're really good at, at making you feel like you don't have any options and playing like super aggressive and high and coming up and marking your, the players that you want to, that you want to pass to. So I think the Manticores unfortunately ended up in a lot of just like holding onto the ball and trying not to get baited into making a pass that's going to get beat out or intercepted because their, their defense is just is so aggressive, um, especially when we had trouble at the start trying to get control of them. It meant there wasn't really a lot we could do. It was really like, it was a difficult puzzle to figure out. Once we got control and things started flowing a bit more, it definitely got better. It was probably one of the most fun and best games we pulled out because everyone, once again, just like Anchor Fun and just like all the other really tough top games we had this entire year, Everyone stepped up to a whole new level of gameplay. Everyone was making crazy tackles. Everyone was making very, very smart plays on offense. People weren't dropping any catches. That there wasn't like a single drop catch that entire thing. Everyone felt the energy of that game, and anyone, everyone was super vibed in on that being a very high energy, very focused game. Um, and I think it was a really good show. And I think the fact that we stayed in range against Manicors that entire game. Um, almost pulling out of range at one point, but like Manicors have never been that threatened by another team in a finals before ever, so that was pretty cool. At Corfu we were lucky to not get any injuries until the final, um, and I think that injury was definitely very scary and definitely impacted the final. Um, I know a lot, definitely for me, it's really stressful seeing a player go down, um, luckily he's alright, but it definitely impacted the tone of the game because it became Quite like there was a long break and it was quite scary for like a few minutes there. Um, it was very unfortunate that Harry got injured, but after that happened, the game took another step up and the, the intensity that UC brought, pushing Manicore up to 20 um, QPD up uh, at one point, really showed how much the Unspeakables were a successful team that was successful because of the emotion that we put into it. We played the way we felt. But I think we managed to pull together and double down for what we lost and work harder because of it. And in that game, we really brought and put all that we could on the table. So it felt like um, everyone was contributing, everyone was working hard and it was everything that we'd wanted for the whole year. Like the way we were playing, Manticores were an incredible team and such a challenge to play against. And that made it all the more rewarding when we could you know, score goals or, or save goals in that game. The stitch catch in the grand final was, it was this moment of like, I saw it happening. Like I saw, I was watching the snitch. I was watching Alex going for it. I saw Demo throw him down. I saw Dylan in the background sort of, his like eyes light up as he screamed for it. And I was like, oh no, this is it. And I saw him grab it. I was like, that was clean. That was pretty clean. So you can do about that. Um, and it was this very surreal moment of, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like the entire year leading up to that moment. It was like, oh. Which is really rough and I haven't actually watched that footage back yet so I don't really know exactly what happened and what the circumstances was um, but I mean at the end of the day 
It was still a fantastic game, it was still a fantastic tournament, it was still a fantastic year leading up to that. And all the work that we put into getting to that point still like paid off um, massively and paid off like beyond what I thought it would. Like the game we played against Manicores, I could never have could never have envisaged us playing that well against such a strong team. But it was an emotional time, um, I think, for a lot of people having put so much time and effort into it. Um... Guys, at the end of the day, this catch is like that happened. Um, at the end of the day, we had a game plan, we went in with that plan, and we executed that plan, and it was freaking amazing. That was the guest game, I kept on saying this all throughout the year. That was the guest game, like, game of push we've ever played. You can't fall us for anything in that game. That was absolutely textbook perfect. That was absolutely amazing. Stuff on offense was absolutely amazing. The plays we did. Everyone here played their absolute heart out, and that's all we asked of you this year. This is all we have to put it everyone here this year, and we bring it off. Like, this is still fantastic. It still felt like a really good game, and it felt like we were playing like top Quidditch, and I think that's what's important. Like, everyone worked hard, and that's the best we can ask for. Yeah, we did a lot this year. Like, I mean, we keep saying, oh, we lost Quaffle, and I've said this before, like, we didn't lose Quaffle, we came second in Quaffle. We did a lot of winning in Quaffle. <laughs> we won, like, nine games or eight games to get to that point, um, including some phenomenally tight, close games. We played Fantasy, Fantasy Final, and we played a whole bunch of other crazy tournaments at the year we won. Um, we lost, like, a number of games you can count on one hand that we lost the entire year. Um, which is also insane in its own right. Three medals is pretty cool. Four if you count state, because there's a lot of people on the state team. Um, <laughs> which is fantastic in itself. Um, I think as far as success goes, the fact that everyone got so much out of this year, and everyone really enjoyed this year so much. Um, not just on speakables, but on unbreakables, on people's in the cold club in general. I would definitely consider 2018 a success for not only just the unspeakables, but for the unbreakables and the unforgivables as well, because they've achieved a lot of the goals that they had at the beginning of the year. The unbreakables won Division 2 of NQL, which was a big goal that they had going into the year. And the unforgivables, even though they may not have had a big goal like that, they showed that they're still a really good team and they had such a great time this year learning and growing as players. And so I would say that 2018 has been a really big success for UCID as a whole. It was a hell of a year. The Unbreakables came so far. At the start of the year to the end of this year, we had such change, such synergy. Everyone figured out where they are, where they stood in the team. So I'm just proud of everyone, really. We did so well. We did not finish at the bottom of any ladder, either in, in the New South Wales League or in the, on the National Quaffle ladder. Like, so that's a huge win for us. Uh, we, we didn't expect to be there. We started hoping that we could do that and it, it worked out well. It was just such an incredible year, full of ups and downs, but it was, it was so rewarding in every way. And I think that's what matters. It's not really about winning. It's about working hard and challenging yourself. And we got to do that along with a bunch of really cool people who also wanted to work hard and challenge themselves. The best part about the year wasn't the winning, but it was how much fun we had. Um, as a team, as a club. I think as far as the future is concerned, I think the most important thing with running a Quidditch club, like you said especially, but like running any Quidditch club in general, fabliness and like keeping that tight-knitness of the club um, at the core of everything that happens in the club, we're a real family hanging out all the time. That's what Quidditch has become for so many people this year and last year. Um, and that's really the sort of ethos of the club that I try to push is being not just a group of people that play the sport, but a group of people that is a group of friends and a family who hang out again all the time. Um, and don't just play Quidditch on the field because they want to win. They're playing because they want their teammates to win. They're playing because um, they're trying really hard because they really want to do well for their teams and for their, for their friends and for their family. Um, and so I think that's the biggest motivating factor for a lot of people in Quidditch, or I hope it is anyway. It's definitely what motivates me in Quidditch. Um, I think that's, that stays at the heart of what USID is, then USID's going to be fantastic in the future as well. Why?
At the no, end of the no, day, I can be so wholesome. I'm such a wholesome person. Okay, I hate this. It gets really loud. With some friends that I know, always there with a smile, saying you're not alone. Singing la 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 la, kiss her. The tower grows. Stay sun safe. Stay sun safe, kids. <laughs> I got close to Empire. <laughs> Gosha, thoughts? Oh, oh I'm so cute. <laughs> oh my god. I hate myself. Why did I No, yay, yay! Eight? It depends on how he said it. It depends on his intent. No. Nice, Nidia. So if he meant it really meanly, it doesn't matter. Yeah, we're there. Go, go, go. Nidia, don't stop. Don't stop. Project. Sam, turn around to me. Sam, turn around. Bye, Sonny. How's it going, you? Ty. <laughs> Bye, Ty. <laughs>